Our gospel reading this morning is from Matthew, chapter 15, verses 10 through 20. Then he called the crowd to him and he said to them, Listen and understand, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out in the, into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. This is the word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Thanks to God. God. Anybody willing to pray for the preacher today? Then I guess we'll just move on today. You will? Okay, thank you, Teresa. Lord, thank you for this day that we're all sharing together. And thank you for Pastor Terry, who has been leading this church. We pray that she will be healed and will be uh, able to pastor us continuously. Um, pray for everyone who has been through so much this year and to help us, to help us get through all these uh, trying times. Uh, we pray in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Teresa. Chair for the class of 1976, Delaney High School. Yay. That's Teresa, me, Kelly Patrick. We had a lot of good people in that class, so thank you for that. Um, hey, you stupid slave N-word. You are in our sights. We want to kill you. If Trump doesn't get elected in 2024, we're coming to kill you, so tread lightly, B-word. You'll be targeted personally, publicly, your family, all of it. Didn't make that up. Where is that from? Do you know what that is? That was the message left on the federal judge who has been appointed to adjudicate Donald Trump's, one of his trials. That was the message left for her by a member of the community. Is that freedom of speech? Hmm? Maybe you think that's freedom of speech being exercised there? It's a hard question, isn't it? Because freedom of speech does not give you the right to threaten someone's life or someone's family's life. But that's what we've come to. Um, for those of you who think I never read anyone conservative, that I'm just one of those old progressive women, I love David Brooks, who is a conservative columnist and commentator. And he wrote something this week. It's going to be out in the September edition of The Atlantic. It's called How America Got Mean. And he talks about how we've let political tribalism take the place of moral formation in the country because people don't go to church anymore. Schools don't teach morals. He's not talking about personal piety, not talking about being good for goodness sake, but about having some backbone and character and things that used to matter in this nation that don't seem to matter so much anymore. Which is why I decided to put the James lesson with the Matthew. Matthew comes from this morning's lectionary reading. But I put James with it because we are just getting to be a nasty nation, aren't we, in a lot of ways? People saying things about each other that you wouldn't say otherwise. Social media has a big role to play in that because it's a lot easier to put something on somebody's Facebook page than to say it to their face, isn't it? Or to tweet about somebody or to 
put something on Instagram or something like that or TikTok or one of those other platforms. But let's look at what Matthew is talking about here. The disciples approach Jesus and say, do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? When he said, it's not what def goes into a mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles. This is in response to the Pharisees seeing Jesus eating with his disciples and they did not wash their hands. Oh my, oh my, oh my. This is not a COVID response here, folks. This is the law and the tradition that said you got to wash your hands before you eat. They're horrified by Jesus' behavior. And so he says, it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you, but what comes out of your mouth. And he differentiates between what goes out in your mouth and out of the sewer. That's not what defiles you, but what comes out of your mouth because it comes out of your heart. And James, who has written a very blunt book, I always think if I were probably in scripture, I would be James because as Pharisee, when they do my evaluation, say, you're rather blunt, Pastor. I've heard that all my life. I'm blunt. I had a permanent seat in Roger Mark's office in Cockeysville Junior High back in the day. He was the vice principal. I was, I was really in trouble if my mother was there with him when I got sent down there to be told the thing that I was always told, which was, Terry, you do not have to say out loud every thought that comes into your head. And I'd say, I sort of do. And they'd say, no, you don't. Some of you are laughing like, yeah, I got a kid like that myself, maybe. So that's what they're thinking at the time they're thinking it. But you've got to be careful about what you say. And James is the brother of Jesus, the biological brother of Jesus, head of the church in Jerusalem, and he writes a very blunt book. What are some of the other things that is in James's epistle that you can think of? Faith without works is what? Dead. Also, don't just be a hearer of the word, but be a doer of the word. And in the third chapter, he writes about the tongue. Anybody here ever have a tongue that ever got you in a little trouble? No? Nobody here ever gets in trouble for what they say? Alexa's back there with her hand proudly in the air. Sharon's up here. Some of you are honest. You say things to get you in trouble sometimes, don't you? Sometimes unintentionally, sometimes with full intention. He says the tongue is what? It's like the rudder of a ship. It's a small thing, relatively speaking, compared to the size of a sailing ship. But it's what guides the ship. Or a bridle in a horse, um, a bit in a horse's mouth. What does the bit do? It controls which way the horse goes. Horse is big, the bit is small. And he says, compared to your body, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it really can get you into trouble, can it? Oh, some of you have told me stories about things you've said inadvertently that came back to haunt you. So how do you learn to control your tongue? That's the question we've got to ask ourselves. Do we, do we just say it's my freedom of speech? I'm, a, I'm able to say this to you. We've read before in Scripture how even though things might be legal, they're not necessarily right in God's eyes. It's one of those things where you can say what you want, but it's going to have repercussions in terms of your faith. Now... Um, with the tongue we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse people made in the likeness of God. It's hard, isn't it, not to say things that come to your mind at the time? Now, I think one thing that cell phones have done is eliminate the need for people to lie. Because before there were cell phones, what happened in the house? The phone would ring and the kid would answer and say, Mom, it's Grandma. And you say, Tell her I'm not here. Tell her I'm not here. Tell her I'm not here. Right? Now, how many of you have now done that at some point in your life? You know you have, right? Tell them I'm not here, which is, then, then people say, I can abide anything except you lying to me. But unless I tell you to lie to somebody else, that's okay. We get ourselves in all sorts of messes, don't we? My sweet mother one day had something she said to somebody inadvertently. She didn't know she was making a mistake. And the woman said, who said that? Who said that? And my mother said, I'm never going to go to church again because there was somebody in her congregation at the time before they were worshiping here again. And the woman was saying, I'm going to find out who did that. I'm going to, I'm going to have them publicly humiliated. And I said, Mom, what you're going to do is you're going to call her and tell her you did it and it was a mistake and you're sorry. And she said, I can't do that. I'd rather just never go out of the house again. I said, Mom, you're going to do it. She called this woman who was a notorious hothead, said to her, I am so sorry. What I said was not meant to hurt anybody. I thought I was clearing up a situation. I didn't know I was causing problems. I hope you can forgive me. And the woman said, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, I can forgive you. And hung up the phone. It's the end of it. We don't do that, do we? We tend to say things and then just go our merry way instead of trying to make repercussions for what we've done. 
or make reparations, not repercussions. There are repercussions for what we do. Now, we've got to get better at what we say to each other, don't we? What are we, what are we called to say to each other to build up the community? Not, I want you to die, I want to kill you. That's an adult talking to a federal judge on the phone. People are outraged that she's been arrested by the FBI for making a threat against the judge. They're saying it was her right to say that. No, you don't have the right to threaten someone else's life. We do not have that kind of right in this nation. And I think David Brooks is right when he talks about the morality. We don't teach morality anymore, not piety, which is what Jesus is complaining about with the Pharisees. Jesus had no problem with the law. The law was given for what purpose? Why did God give people the law? the Old Testament, the Torah. Why did God give us the law? Why do you tell your kids don't touch that hot stove? Why do you tell kids don't jump off the roof? I know it looks like it would be fun, but you're going to hurt yourself. You're trying to protect each other, right? Now, in Baltimore County, I've learned that speed cameras and yellow lights are sort of suggestions, not necessarily laws. But I broke the law out here four times. I've gotten a ticket now on Warren Road. Four times. You think I'd learn, don't you? Now I set my cruise control when I go past that stinking camera. Sometimes I stick my tongue out at it when I'm not speeding. <laughs> Thinking, okay, if they get me this time, I'm going to say, nope, I only stick my tongue out when I'm not speeding. We've got to get better at what we say to each other. And I'm telling you what, Epworth, i got to warn you all, this is the only church I've ever served where people say nasty things to each other out loud or about each other. To me, my name's Reverend. Usually people hide that stuff from me, but people will come to me and say, I hate him. I hate her. I can't stand what she did. I don't like this about her. I don't like this about him. Or people will send each other nasty little emails and copy me on it. I'm thinking... Don't copy me on that. I don't want to know that. We've got to remember what we say, who we are when we say it. We are children of God made in the image of Jesus Christ to uphold the image of Jesus Christ for one another in the world. We've got to think that when we talk. Because Jesus isn't saying the law is wrong because this isn't the Pharisees with the black hats and Jesus and his disciples with the white hats. This is not a melodrama. This is not one is right and one is wrong. The law was given to protect us. The law was given to show us how to live rightly before God and with one another. But if we use the law against each other, even David Brooks said, it's not about the thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. It's about teaching people to have character and morality in their lives, not piety, which is sort of holding up the law for the law's sake. Jesus had no problem with the law. He had problems using the law against each other. Now, Maybe you've read that in Texas, where we lost most of the United Methodist Church in Texas is disaffiliated, the state of Texas, not Texas, Maryland. As far as I know, there's still a little Texas charge, there's still United Methodist congregations. But in Texas, in the city of Amarillo, every single church disaffiliated. But the people who didn't believe in disaffiliation got together. They've chartered now the Amarillo United Methodist Church. And it's growing by leaps and bounds every day. And over half its members are under the age of 30. Not because they're saying that everybody who thinks a different way is wrong, but they're saying that there's a different way to proceed forward. There's a way to proceed forward in love with one another. And I hope we can get to that point where we can proceed forward in love for each person here, love for each person in our community, love for each person in our nation. Even people like the woman who wrote this, nasty, I left this nasty message for a judge, this threat for a judge. It's not about throwing her out. It's not about throwing her in prison. It's about praying for her. It's about standing up and saying, no, this is not right, but there's a different way to do things. We can disagree with each other politically without going to threats and violence. Don't you agree with that? We can disagree with each other politically without threats and violence. We can disagree with each other on church matters without violence or abuse. We can disagree with each other in many ways and still maintain the bonds of community and love with one another. That's what we're called to do. I love the, the saying here about fresh water and brackish water can't be in the same place. You know, I'm from Maryland. I love brackish water because what comes from brackish water? Crabs. Chesapeake Bay Blue Channel crabs only 
live in brackish water. That's part salt, part fresh. And when I would go to camp with kids who were deaf and screaming and never paying attention to anything, and I'd go into the canoe and I don't swim, I would look over the side and I'd see jellyfish floating by in brackish water and crabs in the bottom. And I didn't want to be in that water. I wanted to eat what? Horseshoe crabs? They're in that water too, but do you want to eat those? No. Oh, do you want to swim with them? You do. You want to swim with the jellyfish? No, you don't want to swim with the jellyfish. They, they sting you. What? They don't sting you that bad. They sting you enough. I tell you, I've heard a lot of kids step on them at camp, and they scream like you wouldn't believe when they step on a jellyfish tentacle. It's stung by one. Anybody here ever stung by a jellyfish? Anybody here want to be stung by a jellyfish other than these two up here in the front pew? Some of these folks are like they're considering it. Hmm. Well, I didn't want to swim in that water, and I don't want that to be what comes out of my mouth toward other people. I like to eat crabs, but I don't want to swim with the crabs. But that's what Jesus is saying to his disciples as well. What goes into the mouth and into the stomach and into the sewer is not what matters. What comes out of your mouth is what comes from your heart. That's what defiles somebody, because from our heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, and slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Now, I didn't read the second part of the lesson this morning, because it's a tough one to do both halves with. And, but we've done it before. It's the woman who approaches Jesus, who's not a Jew, and says to him, my daughter needs to be healed. And he says, why should I take what belongs to the children of Israel and give it to foreigners? Because he is in Tyre and Sidon at that time. He is not in his own place. So this woman comes up to him. She's heard of who he is. She's heard of his greatness, his miracles. And she's got a sick child. She doesn't care that he doesn't love her. She's not a Jew. She goes to the source because she sees God at work in his life. And she says to him, my daughter needs to be healed. And he says something really rude to her. And the disciples are annoyed. That's what that word means in Greek, annoyed. The disciples are often annoyed in Matthew's gospel. And Jesus, I think, is making a point because what he says when she says, she keeps bugging him, he says, it is not right to give the children's bread to the dogs. Doesn't that sound like a contradiction of what we just read about? You know, you don't curse God. You don't curse people with the same mouth you praise God because people are created in God's image. Then she says, even dogs get to eat the crumbs under the table. He says, your faith is great, and it has saved your child. I don't think that's Jesus being nasty and needing to be brought on board with his own thinking. I think that's Jesus saying to the disciples, this is what I'm talking about. Because if you're going to call people dogs, you're going to throw them away. But if you're going to bring them to the table, you're going to have the family of God complete. He says, Jesus moving beyond the kingdom of Israel to the kingdom of God, which is the world. There are lots of people in the world who don't seem worthy of our love. Wouldn't you agree? People who have broken laws, both the laws of the state and the laws of God, people who are hurtful, people who are mean, people who have just cut our hearts out from time to time. We're called to love them. I always say it, and I'll say it again. The people who are the hardest to love are the people who need to be loved the hardest. People who are the hardest to love are the people who need to be loved the hardest. We gotta pray for this woman who threatened this judge. We gotta pray for people who deal with threats and intimidation. We gotta deal with people who are nasty and mean by loving them all the harder because it's gonna irk them like nothing you've ever believed. We can annoy other people just by loving them. Isn't that wonderful? I hope we'll learn from this, just like the toothpaste. You can't put those words back in once they're spoken. We can control ourselves. We can control our tongues. We can control what comes out of our mouths. Because if we remember what comes out of our hearts, it's got to be love for all of God's people. All of God's people. Every last stinking person on the planet is deserving of our love because each one bears the image of God, the Creator, God, the Savior, God, the Spirit, God, the one who is and was and is to come. If we put our money there, that's where the future is going to lie with God. It's a troubled world we live in right now. I know that. It's a politically divided world we live in. We can learn to be one family before God with each other, regardless of what we look like, what we sound like, what we talk like, 
what we are in our hearts. As long as we love God, everything is going to work out for the best because we will truly learn to love one another in Christ's name. And we sang, let the words of my mouth bring you praise. Let the words that I speak be seasoned with your love and grace. May the things of the Lord that I choose to say, choose to say, it's not like we were out of control. Bring glory not name to your, not shame to your name each day. Let the words of my mouth bring you praise. That's from a group called Take Six. Anybody ever hear of Take Six? They were really big about 30 years ago. It's like a boy band, an a cappella group. It's like boys to men only. They only sang about Jesus. They're a young group. They're not that young anymore, I guess, 30 years ago. But they were young when I saw them sing. I was at the um, Methodist Global Youth Gathering in 1989 before some of you were even born. I was there with a the deaf 13-year-old who was one of the preachers of the week. And she preached, and 3,000 kids went, yay, like this. And she stood there and cried. But one of the things we got to do was be with all the artists. There was a woman from Australia who was a singer, a Christian singer, singing about God. She said to me, you are not allowed to stand on the stage with me when I sing, when I perform. I said, why not? She said, my music is universal. It doesn't need interpreting. I said, it does if people are deaf who are trying to listen to it. She said, no. She refused, and I sat there next to this kid trying to sign very quietly in my lap so she'd know what she was singing about. But Take Six had just won a Grammy. They were big in their day. They had six-part harmony with this song. And you can listen to it online because it's still there on YouTube. You can listen to it for free. One of those guys saw me struggling to figure out what six men were singing when they were singing different things. He stopped singing, walked over, broke out of his dance and stood next to me and said the words to me so I could interpret them because what he was saying was more important than how he sounded and their choreography and everything else. That is somebody who knows Christ. That is somebody who puts Christ first because the other guys said later, they said, whatever it takes, we want our words to be known to everybody in the place. That is faith. That's why I want you to learn this song and sing it and if you don't learn the music, it's a little different. And we're only singing one part out of six. And poor Lambert had to pull one song out of six when he just got back off the airplane. But I'd say cut it out of your bullet and put it in your wallet and read it every day. Let the words of my mouth bring you praise. Let the words that I speak be seasoned with your love and grace. Let the things, O oh Lord, that I choose to say bring glory, not shame, to your name each day. Let the words of my mouth bring you praise. Amen, amen, amen.